Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have about 15 minutes uh, maximum for discussion. So I would like to invite the four speakers on the podium, please. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have so many questions that it's very hard to fill the 15 minutes. So I'll ask you, please, to make the question very focused, very short. And we have a microphone, disposable, uh, portable microphone, which somebody will be handing over if you raise your hands. We would like you to mention your name and uh, to which of the four speakers your question is addressed. And we try to accommodate as many questions as possible. Thank you. If you can present yourself, please. Thank you. I'm a Rahman, neurologist. My question is to Dr. Jeffrey about uh, uh, surfactant. Now, until we prevent premature birth and we all out of business. Uh, what, where do you see the future of surfactant uh, replacement therapy for premature infants? Because we were all excited about 10 years ago when we talk about, uh, when we heard about uh, uh, aerosolized surfactant. Now, in our goal is not to intubate babies all the time. We'd be putting babies on CPAP. And we have our cutoff when they like 30% oxygen, we don't intubate them unless they are above that limit. But who knows what the limit should be. So uh, do you see any future for aerosolized surfactants or is it something in the future into genetic therapy maybe for, you know, more changing the expression of the, uh, you know, type 2 cells to produce surfactants? Yeah, I appreciate the question. It's been the holy grail of uh, surfactant replacement to be able to aerosolize. Uh, the great problem with surfactant is that it is like soap and it makes bubbles. And so it's very inefficiently aerosolized and uh, the deposition is, has been very difficult. Uh, many, many people have, have tried. I think there are new devices that are still uh, being studied. The preparations that Mother Nature made um, which contain SPB and SPC are remarkably good surfactants. Uh, we've made recombinant proteins and synthetic peptides uh, many years ago, and uh, none of them are perfect and uh, they function, but none of them are quite as good as what Mother Nature has brought. So I think we have excellent surfactants that are as good as native entire surfactants. Uh, we've studied the delivery volumes and, and uh, amount of surfactant. I think we have a good uh, uh, handle on that. And I think we've learned over the last years uh, the timing um, isn't entirely critical and we have some time to decide what mode of therapies are best. So um, I hope someday we simply don't have to intubate babies and that lung maturation can be induced in utero. Steroids are very effective and our uh, penetration in our obstetrical population is around 90 to 92 percent now. So uh, from our community standpoint, uh, glucocorticoids are a, a fantastic prevention and I, ho I hope that these molecular studies will provide us a new insight and there are many pathways that we don't understand for lung maturation and so I think many studies to do but I have no answers uh, other than We've made great progress over the last few decades. I'm sorry. The oh. Perfluorocarbons as the vehicle to deliver surfactant in the lung, liquid ventilation. Um, I think the exper experimental uh, studies with liquid ventilation are, uh, are really problematic. Uh, and um, I don't see um, success coming soon from my own, but uh, I'm old and I have a conventional wisdom uh, in, in neonatology. So many times we've seen conventional wisdom go away once we learn, once we learn more. Other question, please. Uh, yes, Salim Basri from the uh, Department of Pharmacology, UAE University. The question is addressed to Dr. Zupardi. Um, as you talked about neuroprotective effect strategy uh, involving anticonvulsants, and you talked about uh, topiramide and phenobarbitone, and then in your subsequent slides, you said that 
Of course, there could be some doubtful efficacy when it comes to phenobarbital. Now, could it be due to this antidepressant effect and a reduced respiratory drive? So, so, sorry, could you repeat the last bit? The... Yeah, uh, could it be due to this antidepressant effect and reduced and respiratory drive? I'm not quite sure what the nature of the question is, but... Um, you want me to repeat it? Well, I, did I understand you saying that do the anticonvulsants reduce respiratory drive? Uh, yes, because phenom barbitone, as you know, seen as a person, it can sure. reduce the respiratory drive. Sure. Could that be the reason for it being little doubtful efficacy? Okay. Um, well, uh, all the babies that were entered into these clinical trials were actually ventilated. Um, um, from birth and remained ventilated for at least 24 hours um, after birth. So um, the effect of these anticonvulsants on the respiratory drive wasn't really uh, examined. It wasn't thought to be a significant issue at that stage. But clearly, if we, were, if we are going to cons consider using um, uh, anticonvulsants prophylactically in, in less severely affected babies, um, you need to be careful about uh, adverse effects, and that's why you need to do studies to see what the effects would be. Um, just as Ola talked about adverse effects of oxygen, completely unexpected to clinicians, there might be an unexpected adverse effects with agents which appear to be neuroprotective. Because the reason I ask is because it can also, sorry, it can also affect the, the sensitivity to the uh, PCO2, because it's a person, it can also affect the PCO2. Yeah. The sensitivity to uh, PCO2. Yeah. I mean, it's a very complex area because, um, for example, we don't know what is the optimal CO2 levels uh, if you're trying to target the neuroprotection. And there are animal studies that suggest that hypercapnia could be neuroprotective, for example. Um, so it's a very, very complicated question. That's why you almost always need to try and focus down into your best bet and then do, so, so long as you have very robust, supportive experimental data, then you need to embark on proper clinical studies to know the improving outcomes. Dr. Shadid Tawam Hospital Al Ain, my question to Professor Anne Greenow. It's, it's about uh, tidal volume or volume uh, targeted ventilation, four versus six mil kg. Um, now, is it fair to suggest that since the dead space is about the same in a five, seven hundred gram baby and the older 32, 33 weeks baby, which is about 0.5 mil. Is it fair to say maybe 4 mil kg, 5 mil kg would do for bigger babies because the uh, dead space takes smaller part of their tidal volume? Sorry, I, um, sorry, I think I probably didn't make it clear. We're, we're, it's 4 mils per kilo. Yeah, per kg. Rather, rather, and so we're comparing 4 mils per kilo rather than 6 mils per kilo. And of course, the baby's anatomical dead space is also related to their weight. So it's about 2.2 mils per kilo. So in that way, it's fine. I think the problem is, of course, when you end up with a very large physiological dead space because the baby's got severe lung function abnormalities. And then the question is, do you want to limit the level of volume targeting because you've got a very small area if you like, to ventilate, or do you still want the same level of volume targeting? And certainly what we've shown, because when we, then that's when we, that's why we've done these studies in weaning and acute respiratory distress, we thought the work of breathing would be different in the two groups, but actually it's the same. And when we've measured vent babies on a ventilator breathing, they tend to breathe at about six mils per kilo. So they have got an inbuilt minute volume that they're working to. Mahmoud Galal. The first 